the conservative system. So it's in section 6.5 of Strogatz. This is a special case of a Hamiltonian system. And the inspiration comes from Newton's law for a one degree of freedom system. So if you could have motion in one dimension, let's call that dimension X. X is our one degree of freedom, and I mean a mechanical degree of freedom, then mx double dot equal to f. So that's mass times acceleration equals some function, the force. We could rewrite this as x double dot equals f of x over m. It's a second order ODE that has special structure. It can be written in the form of Hamilton's equations, if we pick something, which comes from energy. We can write the force, f of x, as being the negative gradient of a potential energy function, v. This is just a function of the one scalar variable, x. So this would be just the total derivative of v with respect to x. v is called the potential energy. We can, by a trick, show that there is a function of x and x dot that is constant, meaning it doesn't change with time. If we rewrite this as m x double dot minus f, which means plus dv dx equals zero. So we've just rewritten Newton's law in one dimension. We could do a trick, which is multiply both sides by x dot. If we multiply both sides by x dot, we get m x double dot times x dot plus dv dx x dot equals zero. But this left-hand side, we could also view it as the total derivative of one half m x dot squared plus v of x. That'll give us up above using the chain rule. We're using the dv dt, where v is a function of x, which is a function of time, is going to be dv dx, x dot. So this means that the thing inside the parentheses here is a function that remains constant along trajectories of our two-dimensional ODE system. So we'll call this the total energy, the function of x and x dot. And you'll notice the total energy is the potential energy plus this other thing, which is the kinetic energy. E of x and x dot is one half m x dot squared. That's the energy due to motion plus v x. So total energy is kinetic plus potential energy. And we've got that d e dt equals zero. So e is constant along trajectories. Another way we say it is that this is a conserved quantity. And that's where we get the label conservative system. Our original system, if we were to write it in terms of first order derivatives, it would be x dot equals y and y dot equals negative one over m dv dx as a function of x. Our original system, this thing, is a conservative system. And we could write it in terms of x and y instead of x and x dot, one half m y squared plus v of x. Now I said this um, special case of a Hamiltonian system. First, let's back up and we could say something about more general idea of a conservative system. So more generally, any system that's of this form, and we're just thinking 2D, where dE by dt equals zero for some, and maybe I'll throw in non-trivial function, E is a conservative system. So in a larger sense, if you have a system that conserves some scalar function of your dynamical variables, then we could say that's a conservative system, even if it doesn't come from mechanics. So you have to be uh, careful when someone says, oh, this is a conservative system, or this is a conservative force. You need to you know, ask them specifically, what are they talking about? So up here, I was thinking of, you know, I, I know the specific form for E, it's always going to be this, but you could have situations where this function e is something else. The non-trivial means I'm not just saying that, you know, e equals uh, three. That's a, that's a function that everywhere equals three, but that doesn't really tell us anything. The technical way to put it is that we require that e x y equals some constant along trajectories, and it is not constant in any open set. 
meaning so if i've got you know, here, here's a trajectory e is constant as i go from here to here anywhere along there but if i take any open set that means i've got to have some region then e will not be constant along that it has to be different for different trajectories that's what is meant by non-trivial e equals three would not count that would be lame this mass sort of gets in our way i get annoyed by it so for any system where and i'll write it this way x double dot equals some function of x this is just the scalar x anything that can be written this way and maybe you could uh if you're really bothered that there's no mass present you could think that m is one but really it's just not there you know, any system that can be written this way is going to have a conserved quantity that looks a lot like total energy because the f of x can be used to obtain the potential energy v and here i'm thinking of a potential energy that doesn't necessarily have the same units as above this is just some function v that we get by taking f of x and integrating it if you do that then you've got your v and then x double dot actually there should be a minus sign in here somewhere minus then x double dot equals minus dv dx for that v that's a function of x and then energy the conserved energy in this case will be one half it's since it's like we have m equal to one this will be one half x dot squared plus v x so for any system where we have that we get we have a conserved quantity and it's this this is a special case of a Hamiltonian system where H, and we were writing before H is a function of X and Y. So if we say H is one half Y squared plus V of X, it just looks like we've written the energy, but in terms of X and Y. So if we take this and apply the rules for getting a Hamiltonian system, this is X dot partial H partial y y and y dot is negative partial h partial x and the only x dependence is in the v so this will be negative derivative of v with respect to x it's not partial because v only depends on x we've recovered it and it's a special case in uh, not only the sense that it's got a special form but we'll also only have fixed points along the x-axis. And they'll be of the same type as for Hamiltonian systems. So only centers and saddles. Let's look at an example, just so you can hopefully follow along. Because of the connection with mechanical systems, sometimes these could be more intuitive than the others. But let's think of a particle in a double weld potential. So I want something that kind of looks like a W shape for my function. If I say this is my potential energy, V, and it looks like negative one half X squared plus one fourth X to the fourth, then I've got something that looks like that. If I put my coordinates in here, here's X, here is V of X, and we've plotted the curve. So this would give us, we've got X dot equals Y, y dot equals the negative gradient of x, or negative derivative of v. So this gives us x minus x cubed. Well, the nice thing about uh, having a conservative system where you've got a potential energy is that from the plot of the potential energy itself, you could get what the, uh, what the fixed points are and what type, right? Because now this is just a, this is just a 1D curve. So we have a 1D potential energy curve. The bottoms are, uh, the wells are centers and the hilltops are saddles. So you could directly plot below what things look like in terms of X and um, Y, because Y equals X dot for these systems. So you could, I mean, think of being near this point on the right and I'll draw a, this is a contour of constant energy. If we have this energy, we could draw energy as a horizontal line and the gap between energy and the potential energy curve is one half 
x dot squared. That equals e minus v. So that 1 half x dot squared goes to 0 at the end points. So we could even plot those as points down here. They're going to be points of turning for the trajectory. And the fastest will be where that gap is the largest. So we could plot a point up here. That's when we're going from left to right. When we're going from right to left, it'll be down here. And you could plot a closed curve where for positive x dot, positive x dot means x is increasing. So the arrow is going to the right. And for negative x dot, things are going to the left. We could also think of the contour of energy. You could really just go from the potential energy curve. Now over here on the other side, at the same energy, there's this fixed point. And for that same energy, we'll also have trajectory going in a circle. If I were to plot this down here, the turning point. For the saddle point, the saddle point is in, in the middle. And think of the energy passing through the saddle point. So now I'm just going to overlay right there. Here's for a higher energy. Maybe this first one we'll call energy E1. Here's energy E2. What happens here? We've got that there is a turning point for positive x and negative x. There's also a turning point right in the middle, but this is going to be a saddle, meaning it's got two halves and they meet in what looks like a point, but really this is because it's the stable, oops, I drove the arrow wrong. Stable and unstable directions meet up. And then for an energy above that, say up here, this is E, second one was E2, this is E3. For some other higher energy, maybe I'll do this in blue. It'll have a turning point, only two turning points. It'll reach some minima right in the middle and then be at some maximum above. So we can kind of sketch what this will look like. Everything will be, here's closed curves. And then at the turning points, that's where X dot goes to zero. And down below, we get the mirror image. So in some sense, these are all the trajectories. You'll notice that the special trajectories here seem to separate two different types of behavior, either oscillatory motion in one well versus the thing that's kind of going back and forth around both. I say particle in a double weld potential. This literally describes how a, like a marble would move on a one-dimensional track that has this shape. And in my office, I actually have a one-dimensional track. <laughs> Looks like that. But uh, due to damping, things eventually end up at one of the stable equilibria. So you don't have perpetual periodic motion. But these special trajectories, I don't think we've named them before. They're called homoclinic trajectories. And you might think about what, you know, homo means same. Clinic is kind of like inclined towards. These are trajectories that are inclined to return to, in this case, the neighborhood of the fixed point they started near. They aren't actually connected to the saddle point because they're, it's asymptotic in both forward and backward time. These trajectories are asymptotic to the saddle point, which is at the origin in forward and backward time. If we call this point X star, then a homoclinic trajectory is one that um, X as a function of time approaches X star as T goes to both plus and minus infinity. Sometimes these are called doubly asymptotic, but it's a special type of doubly asymptotic. You could also have trajectories that are heteroclinic. We don't have that in this case, but heteroclinic means that it's negative asymptotic to one fixed point and positive asymptotic to another. But these typically will be special trajectories that seem to divide qualitatively different types of behavior. In this case, there's actually two homoclinic trajectories. We wouldn't say there's one, we'd say there's two. There's this separates the yellow from the blue region. And then over here, we have so we've got two homoclinic trajectories. Maybe we call this the one on the positive side, the positive one, and then there's the negative one. So they separate oscillating around one of the fixed points versus oscillating around both. Given a potential energy like that right there, if you follow these rules, you could construct what the face portrait looks like, which is nice. Another point of view is given by looking at the plot of the total energy. And it, 
the total energy is also the same as the Hamiltonian, but I'll follow how the book does it and say, okay, this is E. It's one half y squared plus v. So think of this as a height function. This gives the height E above the x and y plane. What's being shown here are sort of horizontal slices through this energy surface, giving the idea of what the motion looks like. And if you project down, like take this energy over here, this is for some particular energy. It's like we've taken a slice. So E X Y equals some constant we'll call E1. Then you project down onto the X Y space. It doesn't necessarily tell you how trajectories move. You have to get that through some other information, but it does tell you the path that the trajectories are on. So that's the left side and then the right side. And right, if we were to fill out all of these, the special energy right, that slices through, in some sense, uh, the crotch of what looks like two pants. This is uh, EXY equals E, I think I called it E2. You would then project the contour, the intersection of the horizontal plane with this surface, and you would get that trajectory it magically maps back on itself. And then finally up here, taking slices at different energies. So here's EXY equals E3, going up in energy, and then this will be. So the local minima, you can see from here, the local minima of this energy surface are center type fixed points. The saddle of this total energy surface if you were to look locally, that it would be, it would have the shape of a saddle. There's direction which it's curving up, and then direction which it's curving down is a saddle point. I'll end with the pendulum. And we're just talking about the simple pendulum. So there's a, there's a pivot point, and we're looking at how this mass moves back and forth. It's got a length L. If you go through the, the derivation of, of this, you'll get that theta double dot equals negative, and so let me draw gravity going down, acceleration due to gravity. The parameters that enter are G and L in the form of G over L, and then sine theta. So this is a nonlinear ODE, but you'll notice this is of the form X double dot equals a function of just x, where here x is theta. This becomes easier if we were to non-dimensionalize by using the frequency omega is square root g over l, and then introduce the non-dimensional time tau is omega t. And I'll still just use double dots. It's not upsetting, but we've now non-dimensionalized using that time so that we, we get rid of that pesky g over l. And so now we get purely this. Following the procedure from up above, we say, well, this is equal to a negative derivative of a potential energy V with respect to theta, where V is negative, the integral negative sine theta d theta. If you work out what that is, you'll get cosine theta. And anything that doesn't depend on theta doesn't matter. So you might be worried about constants of integration they don't matter. So then this tells us what the energy is. Total energy, theta, and then we'll I'll call the other one, uh, hopefully not to be confusing, but V. So this is one half V squared minus cosine theta. We're saying here that theta dot equals V. That defines this little V, not capital V. We'll write it that way, make it easier. So now we've got our energy. We could plot the energy it's probably easier to just go from the potential energy function and sketch what the face portrait would look like. The potential energy is negative cosine theta. What could be easier? So here's theta, and up here I'll do uh, I'll plot V theta. I got to remember what cosine looks like. Let me put places where pi and negative pi will be. Cosine, okay, I, I always got to remember that. Okay, so negative cosine has a well, at zero, I don't have to plot beyond plus or minus pi because physically it's the same location. I like doing this weird little thing where I say identify. 
so that's what the potential energy looks like. And now I can below here, just from the rules plot, what the face portrait looks like. So this has a well at the bottom here. So things will be sort of circulating around that. I can locally picture that. And then there'll be an unstable point at plus or minus pi, the same unstable point, and it'll be saddle type. So if I were to kind of sketch the energy there, this will be something that reaches a maximum at some point, and then comes back down. And then there's stuff up above there and below, and then other curves inside here. So qualitatively, you can get what it looks like. That's the pendulum. Now, of course, because it does live on the cylinder, we can we can identify the plus or minus pi. So we can say, oh, no, no, this is really on the cylinder. From the total energy point of view, this is what it would look like. So we're showing, we've cut it, we've taken that piece of paper and then cut it plus or minus pi and glued it. And then this is what we get, something that looks like this. And then we've even said that center that corresponds to the downward position is at energy negative one. And then these are homoclinic trajectories. There's two of them. It's homoclinic because they're returning to the same point, physically the same point, the unstable inverted position. That has energy equal to one. And then energy greater than one corresponds to either circulating around totally clockwise or circulating around anti-clockwise. And this phase space really is the cylinder. Got another picture I think that I'll end with. Shows kind of the front and the back so that's where we'll end.